Uh, welcome to the research seminar series. I have just a really brief announcement to make before Dorothy and um, Carrie get started. Just about some upcoming events. Um, May 23rd, we have the research orientate, orientation program. So if you have new employees to research, this is just a four hour program from 8 to 12 that just gives you some basics and fundamentals of research. So if you have anyone that you would like to send, you can email us at uh, Chris's training and we can get you the registration form. And then June 13th, we have another research seminar series that's, um, it'll be Denise McKenzie reporting on the um, ct.gov website. And then June 20th, um, we're just gonna be brainstorming ideas for uh, new research education topics. Um, so with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Carrie and Dorothy. Woo! All right, guys. Um, so this is supposed. This Wait a minute, I just got So hi, I'm, I'm Dorothy Shaw, and I just want y'all to know that I've been doing regulatory about ten years, and I've been knowing Carrie about thirty, and she has another life that isn't regulatory, and it's theater. Oh. And so that's why she's a good teacher, and that's why she came up with this session. And I think that we're all going to get a lot out of it that's practical, that's useful, but only if you participate. So I have a little piece of candy for every person <laughs> who says something in this room. <laughs> all right, so let's. Can I? Let me get it on the um, actual slideshow. Um, all right, let's see this little critter on the other side. All right, so what we're doing here, guys, is I'm trying to go practical. Like, what do we want from this question? What do we want from that question? There's a lot of information in here, and I may just go, look, there's a slide on that, and then send you guys the slides. Um, because I want to talk, I want to be able to talk about some things about major areas that hold people back from approval, like the things that we query the most, the things that we ask about the most. Now, disclaimer: part of the problem is that. Ah, uh, 지금 이제 뭐가 이제 가 왜요? 갔어요? 어, 나는 여기 여기 가는 줄 알고 난. That's not even what I'm doing. All right, so yeah. interesting development. Um, I, I don't really know what to do about that. Do we know why we're getting. They can't hear us on the. Yeah. Yeah. How to write IRB? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. 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 어, 어, 이제 된다. If you haven't muted your phone, please mute your phone. We're getting some really weird stuff and can't talk over it. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's cross our fingers that that's just not a commercial break or whatever that was. All right. So we're going to go over the major areas of the HSP that cause uh, you know that cause the most back and forth. And like I was saying at the beginning, the problem is is that within this room are coordinators, investigators, and staff of people who work on a wide variety of research. So we can't ask a question in a way. 
will hone in on the specifics of your research and hone in on the specifics of yours and hone in on the specifics of yours. So there's a lot of generalities and assumed knowledge that come into the application. We just can't ask, oh, you're doing community-based participatory research, so please make sure you do blah, 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 blah. Or, oh, you're doing hemoc research, and please do blah, 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 blah. You're going to have tissues, you're going to have people, you're going to have surveys. So it, it's not, there has to be some intuition on your part. So that's why I'm going to go over some of these things so that we can talk through like what we want there. And these, to me, were the ones that generate the most comments, either from the board or from the staff. All right. Yeah, we're just going to have more complication now. Okay. Um, this is probably... Um, okay, general notes. So overall, oh overall, it's Grace Park. It's Grace Park. Grace Park. Grace Park, if you can hear me, we would really appreciate it if you would mute your phone. Can we mute her? Yes. 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 Thank you. Okay, um, all right. I'm this right here, this thing I, in this very first item is the number one piece of advice I can give you. I think now we're getting children or dogs. Um, and this is, number one is do not cut and paste. Everybody does it. It is so tempting. It's going to mess you up. And here's why. Your, app, your grant application is, is organized in a different way. And it's seeking information for different purposes. So information that you guys want to do is go copy, paste, because it says something in the grant funding application about methodology. Well, first of all, the funding application is probably going to be way too technical. It's going to have words we don't understand. And remember, we've got... It, people who have to be lay people. So it's going to be way too technical. It's not going to have some things that we do want in it. It may merge concepts that we want separated. And it's just going to be a hot mess. They're not going to like it. They're going to tell you to rewrite it anyway. So really, really avoid doing that. Now, when you talk about protocol, Sometimes that can be helpful. Sometimes protocol is a lot more practical written and it can be used. But again, it's written for different purposes and for a different audience. And so it still needs editing. You can never just cut and paste and go, whoo, done. Never going to work. Never. And sometimes the informed consent is where I have been known to cut and paste from. That's probably your better bet but it's going to be missing details too so again it's never going to be the only thing you do you're never going to be able to cut and paste and be <coughs> done you will have to put fingers to a keyboard uh read the question every time use lay language that's number two use lay language we don't know your jargon we don't know your acronyms and we don't know all that stuff sometimes you don't either which is why you cut and paste so, it's, you know, sometimes you're just going to have to go to the investigator and go, what does this mean? <coughs> um, jargon acronyms, don't recycle old versions. They're not always going to be your friend. And this is going to be advice I'm going to have you take away the whole time. This is how I kind of describe it to my staff is, if you can't make a mental movie of it, you're probably not, it's probably not enough. If you can't go... Okay, well, they're going to walk in the door, and they're going to go over here, and they're going to do that, and then I'm going to ask them to do this. If you can't do that, you probably haven't given us enough, right? All right, so that's my big overall takeaway for, for application, consent, everything. All right, now we're going to go for people. So let's talk about personnel. What kinds of things have you guys been getting personnel-wise? Back from the IRB. Training. Training. Qualifications. Qualifications. That's an interesting one. Where do you put the qualifications? Put it on that table, right? 
So I don't know if you guys know, but that thing way over on the side says responsibilities and qualifications. You know what we normally get? Study design. <laughs> Thanks for that helpful info. <laughs> I didn't tell me. <laughs> oh look, you got the goodie bag. Yeah. Somebody else talking on this. So what else, what other kinds of things do you guys say? Responsibilities so that they can consent. Right. So responsibilities, are they are they consenting? But we don't just want to know that. We want to know who's doing what. And 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 why do you think that is? There's lots of little pieces involved with personnel. There's HIPAA questions in there. Are they allowed to do that? Are, are they allowed access to that population? Um, it's got the name of the person, their degrees, and their department. So you guys will go, Carrie Oliver, MPHCIP, uh, OIRB. Well, you guys know what the OIRB. But what if I said C-I-R-T-L? Who all knows what that is? Yeah. It's a place here at UAB, it's department. But you wouldn't know what that was. We don't either. Actually, it's the Center for Instructional Teaching and Learning or something like that. But, um, so we need that so that we know whether you're allowed to access that, that patient population. We need to know whether this is a study that involves HIPAA. Maybe that person's in the School of Public Health, which isn't a HIPAA-covered entity, but they're getting data from Dr. So-and-so, who is a HIPAA-covered entity. We, those are the dots we're trying to connect. That's why we need to know that. So no acronyms whatsoever. Really avoid them, because we don't, we couldn't possibly know 20,000 people's acronyms. We just can't. You do. I, I mean, even buildings, y'all. Buildings matter. There are DEXA machines that are covered by the University of Alabama's Medical School uh, Radiology Department, and there are DEXA scans that aren't. And there are completely different rules about incidental findings and who's going to read them associated with that. So we need to know where the heck's the DEXA scan. Because it matters to us, because we're going to have to go get this for this group and not for that group. A lot of pieces to juggle. So no, don't. And let, you can do it once, and then you can write it out and spell it, you know, use the acronym later. But we need them. So, um, so are all the roles described? Um, so a lot of times we'll be, you know, you'll have four people on the H on the section three, and then deep into the HSD somewhere it'll say the the program coordinator will do blah blah blah. And we go back and look. Oh, who, who's that? Nobody was listed as a program coordinator. No one was listed as a study doctor. No one was listed as whatever. So we're if you mention a role, we're gonna look for that role to make sure we have it. So it's all about who's doing what. Yes. So if that person hasn't been hired yet, it's a to be named person. Um, when it, we say it deep in the document, do you want us to say to be named? Right. So you don't go look for So this is an name? overall guidance. Anytime you don't have something, I don't know that person's name, I don't have the um, recruitment materials yet, uh, the survey is to be developed, the intervention materials aren't developed yet. Anytime that happens, proactively acknowledge, I don't have them, and I will submit them via project revision amendment form, and I won't use them until I get approval. When you say that, we're like, fine, fine. But if you say, we're going to send them an email, and I don't see an email, then I have to go, hey, I didn't see an email, and then they're going to have to come back and say, oh, we haven't gotten it developed yet. And then I'm going to have to say, okay, then will you go in and say that I haven't gotten developed? How many days do you think that's going to take? Yeah. It's going to take like three or four at least. If everybody acts on it right away. <laughs> or you could just tell us up front and we got no days. <coughs> right? Any of that. Yeah? 
So when you show up front, is there like a comment section or something? No, like just that? whenever it would naturally come up in your description in the HSP. If we're asking you about recruitment and recruitment materials, you can say flyer not yet developed will be submitted via project revision amendment form. We're happy as a client. Because now we've done due diligence, the onus is on you. You don't submit it, that's a, that's a compliance issue on you. We did our part, you did your part. Make sense? Okay, so again, uh, this was just an example of, you know. Also, my name is in Carrie in Oracle. So you write Carrie Oliver, I'm looking for Carrie Oliver. Or, like most of my mail, if you write Carl Oliver, <laughs> tell, then I'm going to look for that. So make sure you know the names. All right, HIPAA. This was a fun one. I'm so excited about this part. Okay, so HIPAA. What are the problems with HIPAA? Everything that's in the everything. <laughs> well, all right. <laughs> everything. Got all right. <laughs> yep. Who knows? Do, do you guys know that whether or not you're a covered entity? Is anybody in doubt? You don't have to raise a hand, but if you want to, I can help you out. Because there's weird places that aren't covered entities, and there's weird places that are. But covered entity is whether or not HIPAA applies. Do you know the identifiers? So we'll go find out. <laughs> Um, and are you clear what these questions are really about? I'm going to bet now. There's going to be a whole lot of stuff in here, so let's just get into it. Hip identifiers. Shout them out. Birthday. Birthday. What? MRN. Date of birth. Interesting. Date of birth. Date of birth is that. So in the list of HIPAA identifiers, Date of birth is, in fact, a HIPAA identifier. What else? You don't have to raise your hand to everybody else. Zip code? Name. Phone number. Phone number. Address. Hey, you guys actually done pretty good. Because most of the time when I get this out, they go for the first five or six. Name, address, phone number, email, medical record number, social security number. Those are the big, yeah. obvious showstoppers. <clears throat> Most of the time, when people say something's de identified, they mean it doesn't have those six things. Now, what is 18 minus 6? 12. <laughs> that means there are 12 more things that make something identifiable according to HIPAA's eyes. Can you shout it out, some of them? All right, dates. So someone said date of birth. But notice that it doesn't say date of birth. It says dates related to an individual. This is the number one HIPAA misunderstanding. Date of birth is a date related to an individual, but so is date of surgery. So is date of discharge. So is date of sample collection. Dates related to an individual. What do you think is on every single specimen in the University of Alabama? Data collection. How many times do you think we get, we got the identified specimen? Because <laughs> <laughs> most of the time that's not true. It can be true, but you got to do stuff to make it true. It is not inherently true. All right, then we got the numbers. Fax number. Real <laughs> um, health plan number, account number, license certificate number, VIN, the car, device number. I have a fake hip that is Carrie's hip, it is no one else's in the world's hip, just mine. It has a number. So, all right, we have 13. We're at 13, and we're talking about VINs. There's five more. There's five more. You been think of any of them? We got dates, name, address, phone number, da, da, da. we got fax number, all these numbers. Biometric identifier. Pardon? Biometric. Biometric. I heard photos. Let me say up here. Anything else? All right, we're getting there. Full face or otherwise. So full face, yes. Here's here's me. 
But also, um, if I have, I have a tattoo of the little prince. Um, so there's those. Here's a fun one. You want else and IP addresses. This is the second most misinformed piece of information. What if you want to do a survey, an online survey, and you want to use SurveyMonkey? And you tell me, I'm not getting a name, address, phone number, email, medical record number, social security number, I'm not getting any dates, not none of these things, I'm not gonna get into this. Out of the box, most uh, survey sites will collect URLs, IP addresses, and emails, whether you want them or not. You actually sometimes have to pay more to not get them. Okay? And then biometrics, fingerprints, so on 17. So what's left? Everything else. <laughs> they have this wonderful thing. Other things that could identify you in other ways. So mostly they're talking about codes or very specific <coughs> things. You know, if I said, well, some of you are too young, but some of you will understand this. If I said, uh, she had brown hair, uh, she's white, um, uh, dark brown hair, Italian-American, and purple eyes. You would probably get to Elizabeth Taylor somewhere down the road. Elizabeth Taylor, that's a very unique feature of her. So, or something more close to home. Uh, April 27th, tornadoes. You know, somebody put in an application, the title of Head injuries during the April 27th tornadoes. So we have an identifier, a date, right? Now that date isn't really related to the individual, except there were only a handful of people at the University of Alabama who had head injuries, and almost all of them were in the newspaper. So now we have HIPAA. Whoops. Sometimes you have to think it through. All right, let's go over some really fun words that nobody understands. <laughs> Anonymous data. Hey, this data is anonymized. No, it isn't. Data that was collected without identifier. Collected that way. Coded data is data that was collected with identifiers, but the identifiers were removed, were removed and placed, replaced with a code. There should be a key or a link linking them. De-identified data, the favorite word of UAB investigators. <laughs> this is data that was collected identifiably, but information was removed and no code exists. So we have data that was collected anonymously. This was not collected anonymously. We collected the specimen, the data, and then we removed it, no code. Do you get the subtle difference between the three? Now, most people use the identified for all of it, but it's not. So, under HIPAA, it's de identified two ways. So, remember, de identification is an action, it's something you do to data, it's not something that is inherent in the data. Data is either collected anonymously or with identifiers. So de-identification is a thing you do to the data. You remove all the identifiers. And then you either do that through a highly statistical method that you have to prove to us, or um, the data do not include any of the 18, any of the 18 HIPAA identifiers. Any of them. Not one. Not date, not zip code. Not state, not city, no, no. An unlimited data set is the last little term. So this is something I want you guys to know. So limited data set is capital L, capital D, capital S. It's a thing. It's like, um, I don't know, a, a HIPAA. It, it, it means something. It doesn't mean a data set that is limited. 
It doesn't mean I'm only collecting a couple of things or two or three. Very specific definition. All the 18 HIPAA identifiers are removed except dates of any kind, so you can't collect date of birth, or geographic locations larger than a street address. That is the definition of a limited data set. That is LDS, limited data set, not data set that is limited. That makes sense? So you guys will get copies of these slides. Please commit them to, well, I'm just going everywhere. Um, you know, get the word out. All right, so I'm probably running really low on time already. Um, Purpose. So I, I'm just gonna, all right, so the purpose, you probably don't get a whole lot of pushback on the purpose, but anybody got any ideas of what some of the issues are in the purpose section? Remember, it's purpose and then background. Especially background features. So sometimes people put background into the purpose. The language is not okay. It's too long. Sometimes it's just not understandable. <laughs> what did you say? I said the language is not layman. It's technical. It's technical because a lot of times people cut and paste it. And it's, you know, the specific games are to, you know, blah, 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 blah. And it's, you know, what is it? So what do we want to know? What do you think we want to know about the purpose? <coughs> it's really simple. Why are you doing this setting? So, here's a purpose. The purpose of this project is to collect biospecimens from participants with pressure ulcers. Is, is this a good purpose? Who thinks it's a good purpose? Raise your hand or nod your head. Who doesn't think it's a good purpose? All right, you guys are right. Why? Too broad. It, it's not really specific, but also, is there a why in there, or is there more of a what? More of a what? I'm going to collect biospecimens. It's like saying the purpose of my project is to collect data. That's what it's saying. And that's not the purpose. Why aren't you collecting the data? Right? All right, so what about this one? The purpose of this project is to reduce the number of pressure ulcers in the UAB palliative care unit. Anybody got any comments on this one? Well, is there a lot? I mean, the reason they're doing it is to reduce the pressure ulcers. Yeah? There's no how. Like, how are you going to do that? Well, that's not, but that's not the place for this. This is just the why. Yeah? Well, so the what you're going to do will come later. So this is really just why are you doing it? This Again, that's going to fall into the what. This is just the why. Here's what's wrong with this. And this is what we get a lot. This purpose actually implies that you are not conducting research. Surprise? Yeah. This purpose actually implies that you are doing quality improvement. And you don't necessarily need IRB approval or to fill out a genetics <coughs> protocol if you are only doing quality improvement. This is saying, I am going to attempt to reduce, to stop, solve a problem at UAB. It's a problem, it's not purpose. Yeah, it's a problem, it's not a purpose. It's, it's really not telling us a research endeavor. A <coughs> research purpose is going to imply, I wonder if, what happens when? This is, no, we're just gonna, we're just gonna solve this problem. At UAB. Now I would ask questions. This is probably just a poorly worded. There probably is research in there. But the fact is, I have to ask the question, and as we've established, I ask the question, they ruminate, they call me up because they don't really understand the question because they thought they did it right. So they're gonna call me up, we're gonna chat. They're not gonna get me right away because I'm on vacation because I'm heading to Florida, and then they're gonna come back. So again, think about that purpose. <coughs> All right, last one. The purpose of the study is to, to determine 
gotta wonder. I wonder if. A multi-approach novel, this is new, not something established and already solved. Bed turning protocol can reduce pressure also rates in a palliative care population. That's perfect. That's not gonna make me wonder whether you're doing quality improvement. That's not gonna make me wonder what the heck you're doing at all. This is a fully fleshed out thought through your purpose. It's also one sentence. That's all you gotta do. But sometimes what you've got is too technical or contains a bunch of background first, which we want someplace else. So probably the most overlooked section, not thought for it too technical, doesn't match the consent. It doesn't have to be word for word. You can be more technical in the HSP than you are in the consent, but they have to match. You can't say the purpose of this is to, to examine a new bed turning policy uh, and then over here in the consent say, you know, we want to see what you think about. You know, they have to match. Um, they sometimes contradict the definition of research, which we saw the first example. And literally just start with this sentence. You'll get there if you start with that sentence. But so many people are just like, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so, all right, so now we're going to move on to background. This is kind of short. Background, I'm just going to go over things that I want you guys to consider. So first of all, when you look at the application, remember back in the, uh, the beginning, I said, read every question. It's hard to do because you guys do this every day. It's hard for us to do because we do it every day. Read the question. Make sure you answer the question and only the question. Here's why. How many participants are in the research? 100. That's your answer. 100. Not? Well, we're hoping to get 100, so we're going to get 200, and then, you know, the extra 100, what we're going to do is if they screen out, we might ask them to participate in another study. So this is how we'll consent them for that. <laughs> and all of a sudden, it's just like, what is it? Or my favorite. We are going to enroll two participants on every Tuesday and Thursday for four months, up to five years. But if that five years we don't, we'll add three participants every Tuesday and Wednesday. Do not make us do math. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is 100. <laughs> Period. <laughs> so, same here. Points to consider. Summary of the research. Keep it simple, but we do want to know kind of what led you there. Why did you decide to do this? But also, our job as IRB is to make sure you're not duplicating something. We want to know what is novel about your study and what you know about getting to where you are. Lots of times, that's going to be things like, how did you decide on your dose levels versus those dose levels? How did you decide on this population versus those populations that those people researched? There's something new about your study. That's why you're doing it. So explain how you got there, because they always ask the board. Um, summarize the significant findings. Go ahead and discuss the FDA status of your drug and device if you have one. Tell us what's happening there, because we're going to ask, it's going to come back to you if we don't know that it was approved for this group, but we're using this group, or it's approved in this condition, but we're using this condition. Explain that to us so we have that framework moving forward exactly what you're doing. Talk about what the current standard of care is at UAB. We need to know, are our patients going to experience something vastly different than they normally would? That's part of human subjects training, or human subjects protection. What's happening to you because you're on research that other people aren't experiencing? And this is where you're going to tell us that. Tell us, give us a summary of the standard care. Use lay language, my favorite. And be brief, just give us significant information. Now, I don't mean brief, brief, but brief, you know, two or three paragraphs. Keep it simple. But, and remember that there are people with no scientific background who have to understand 
not just be able to comprehend the word you're saying, but understand the project. By law, we have to have non-scientists and community members. They represent the participants. So your protocol, every bit of it, has to be understandable to a lay person. Can I ask you a question, please? Yes. Some, sometimes there is link to an article and notation and bibliography that is embedded there. It's okay to just place the link or the, the, the citation part, or we need to attach to the submission the actual article? You know, I have never seen a protocol return because they didn't have the citations. But I know that sometimes the board likes them because they'll go look at them, especially the scientists. They'll go and look them up. So if you have them, there's no problem with putting them there. But if you haven't, I doubt it will get returned for that. All right, here's my next um, fun one. So I want to talk about recruit recruitment and screening. First of all, there's an and in that phrase, which implies that they are two separate events. But a lot of times, we can't really parse out where one starts and stops and where the other one starts and stops. So I'm going to do a little play. <laughs> I told you she was going to have to <laughs> All right? I'm going to be you guys. And we're going to have a pretend. I'm looking forward to come and be my She, You know, I met her in a show. So she got <laughs> with my first member. All right, so you're going to be my potential participant. And you just say yes, that's why. Okay. Um, all right, so Ms. Shaw, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you'd be interested in my protocol. I'm doing some research on um, whether or not uh, people with blue bags give out a lot of candy. And I noticed that you have a blue bag, and I was wondering if you would be interested in this study. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Well, I have a few questions I need to ask you first. I was wondering, do you wear glasses? Yes. Oh, well, okay. And uh, are you deaf? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. And um, you're not eligible for this step. <laughs> <laughs> and C. <laughs> so, I, that, that's obviously not typical, but that process is typical, correct? Right? Yes. Who knows? Whether I did recruitment or screening. Screening. Both. Oh, oh, I did both. Now, tell me where recruitment ended. Would you like to participate? That's when recruitment ended, and she said yes. Right? So that all, recruitment and screening occurred in that conversation. A lot of times that's on the phone or in person. And, and so recruitment was, is, that's one of my little school things. The recruitment is all the activities up to and including asking someone to participate. All the activities. So almost all recruitment starts one of two ways. You either review the medical record against inclusion exclusion criteria, which feels a lot like screening, but it's not. It is part of the recruitment activity. Or there's a flyer, website, some kind of thing. So basically it's the you contact them version of recruitment or they contact you version of recruitment, right? That's pretty much covers most of it. Yeah. All right, so. You contact them. What do you do? How will you do that? You go to the medical record, you find inclusion, exclusion criteria, it spits out 200 people, you need 50. What are you going to do next? Are you going to get their phone numbers and start calling them? Well, then what? We want to know the what will you do, who will do it, uh, what will you say, how you're going to do it. So. So many times I get, we will recruit participants by asking them to participate. I'm not kidding. That is a very common recruitment method. 
except that it's just saying I'm going to recruit people by recruiting people. It doesn't say anything. <laughs> you need to know all those pieces. There's so much right here. Recruitment is probably to me beyond consent. I'm probably telling tales out of school. I think this is the most crucial area right here. When you first approach someone, first of all, are you allowed to? Is it a cold call? Well, hey, Teresa, I hear you had gonorrhea last month. <laughs> <laughs> no, right? Is it, is it gonna make someone want to get in their car and slap you in the face? <laughs> what are you saying to them? Are you allowed to even call them? How are you, there's so much wrapped into recruitment. Are you lying to them? And we've seen that, leaving big pieces out. Are you saying, extra, extra, get $10,000 or whatever, whatever you're, uh, are you over incentivizing? Are you pushing the money versus the altruism? All of those things are involved in recruitment. This is really important. So if you don't know it, then you're not ready to submit. All right, so self-select, they're going to likely call you. So again, how, how they're going to contact you? How are they contacting you? Through a website, through a phone, in person? What are they going to say? What are you going to say? So again, we need all those details. All right, partial HIPAA waiver may only be needed if you are recruiting people who are not your patients. So I'm in... I'm in gynecology, but I'm interested in people with diabetes, and then I want to compare gestational diabetes to regular type 2 diabetes. And so I'm going to recruit my patients for gestational diabetes, but I want to recruit Dr. So-and-so's for endocrinology patients. Well, I, I, I'm not on their care team. I will never be on their care team. So I can't just go get those people and start calling them. I have to talk to Dr. So-and-so. And that's where your partial HIPAA waiver comes in. There's two kinds of partial waivers, one for recruitment and one for screening. There's the same form, but two reasons you need it. That's the recruitment reason. I'm recruiting people who aren't mine. That's a partial HIPAA waiver, yeah? When you're saying aren't mine, a lot of times we have residents or students that are coming in, they may be involved in their exam, but they aren't their patient. That's so they have access to their information. If you're part so of their care team, team. If, you, if you're part of their care team, no, you don't. If I have if I am the on-call physician and could likely see you at some point, mm -hmm. I'm on their care team. Radiologists. They're not everybody's care team. Anesthesiologists, kind of everybody's care team. But they have a lot more. But if I'm sickle cell, I can't go over here and talk to people in, you know, in orthodontia and, you know, whatever. But so, if I'm Dr. Y and I want to look at a patient who's Dr. X and I can be on call for Dr. X, then that's when you're fine. Not. No partial hypo with me. You don't need a partial HIPAA waiver to get identifiable data for your own patients or patients on their care team. So how do you feel about the Department of Medicine then? Like in taking clinic now we we find people doing all the research for several divisions. Uh, 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 but if all those people are on the protocol, so if they then then there are researchers on the protocol are there so that they can connect those dots. In which case, the research is not contacting people outside of the research care team. So if I wanted to do the study I was talking about where I'm in just, you know, I'm OBGYN and this person's under chronology, I'm gonna put that guy on my research. We're gonna do it together. He's gonna recruit his, I'm gonna recruit mine. I might recruit his, but we'll go, hey, I'm gonna go do this with Dr. So-and-so. So that's why there's more than one person on protocol. Uh, I don't want to run out of time. So screening is all the activities after you've asked them to participate. This is sometimes done prior to consent and sometimes done after consent. When do you think you need a partial HIPAA waiver? Prior to consent. So that little doodah that uh, Dee and I just did, I asked her if she was deaf. 
I asked her if she wore glasses. Those are actually conditions. I asked her HIPAA questions. Now, if I asked her what her favorite color was, then I don't need a partial HIPAA waiver. But I asked her if she was deaf and if she had, if she wore glasses. I'm asking her, are you myopic? And do you have a hearing condition? I have now asked protected health information. So in that phone call, I needed a partial HIPAA waiver for screening for that. <coughs> Make sense? Cool. <coughs> All right, so prior to consent, partial HIPAA waiver, after consent, just make sure you fully describe everything. And if it's after consent, if it's actually in the consent form, like you consent them and there's a screening section, make sure you cover a couple of things. The timing of when they're going to learn whether they've made it or not, because a lot of times that's done because there's going to be testing. Testing has to go to labs, maybe a couple of days. So make sure this is all defined. <laughs> when they're going to find out and how they're going to find out. We want to know that. And then if there's compensation, just swing out to get paid. Think about that. I know it's getting hot. Um, sometimes there are multiple recruitment methods. You need to think, I advise you to think every one of them through singly. Describe this one all the way to the end. Then describe this one all the way to the end. If you have a sentence that says, we're going to recruit by word of mouth, at fairs, uh, with referrals from doctor's office, I2, B2, and whatever, you're not going to think through all those processes for each of them. List them out individually. If you've got 10 different methods of recruitment, make 10 different paragraphs. What um, are the rules and regulations about email? And I think you have one so on your email and HIPAA are not friends because uh -huh. it's not secure. So you can't email someone for recruitment and a HIPAA covered entity, they are not friends. There are ways that it can be done, but you're going to have to go through your IT and you're going to have to prove to us that it's, it, it did that. My advice to you is if you want to use HIPAA anywhere, recruitment or edit, as reminder emails or whatever, part of your intervention, if emailing a patient is part of your project in any way, shape, or form, go to your HIPAA IT first before you submit, tell them everything you want to do, Get them to put in writing that they think it's great. We won't ask a question. But if you just say, we're going to email them a reminder, we're going to ask a question. Yeah? Um, what do you discuss when you call up people on the phone and discuss a, a study, for example, if they're a clinic patient or something like that, and they would like you to email them the consent form for you? I would, again, if that's going to be an option that you want to put in your project, okay. cover it because your consent form's got the disease or condition probably in the title and, and all kinds of things in there. So I would discuss it with your IT. You can't just do it. If you want to be able to do it, discuss it with your IT about how you're going to do it. So no matter if it's your patient, no matter if they're already in this, what, what has enrollment still? If you're going to email anything. If you're going to email anything to a patient, period, in a research study, you should go through your IT. There are ways to do it. UAB MC accounts can tend to be encrypted and it can be done. Um, they'll want to, they'll give you wording that they may want you to put in the consent form, um, but you need to go through them. And you need to prove to us so that we don't, because we won't know that you did that. All right, what's my time? All right. All right, methods and procedures. So this is less about what's not getting in there and more about the format and, um, and, um, and how things are put in there. So again, don't cut and paste, especially do not cut and paste this from any grant application, not one. Just don't because the grant application will never, ever, ever do 17A justice. So, a lot of times the protocol can, but it's not complete, because the protocol has things that we would want in 17A broken down in other parts. 
So I'm going to have to stop so that we can talk about this. I'm sorry, I wanted to be more interactive, but I already got the slide up and you've already read it. Um, <laughs> so chronologically, we want to, we really want you to use bullets, indentations, headers, tables, whatever. You have our permission to undo the bold and underline so that you can use bold and underline in other ways if you want. But do not do, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, mm -hmm. call me Ishmael, blah, 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 blah. Because we're not going to be able to find, it's going to take, I will tell you, it will take us, the, this section probably takes us two to three hours to review, if not longer. We've got to compare it to the protocol. We've got to compare it, compare it to the funding application. We've got to compare it to the consent form. We have to understand it. We have to figure out what things aren't there that you said were going to happen. It's a very complex uh, section. It helps if that chronology is there. So first there's a baseline visit, or a first there's a screening visit. Then maybe there's a baseline visit. And then there's visit one. What happens in visit one? Well, there's a lot of procedures, there's a lot of data collection, there's a lot of surveys, you're gonna get them vital signs, what vital signs, you know, physical exam, what does that mean? Your analysis for pregnancy, um, and, and all these other things. But they also might get randomized that day. But randomization in your protocol is a different section. So, I would say 90% of the time, this section is missing the randomization section. Because you've cut and paste, and that's in a different section. And you didn't think to cut and paste from there too. So think chronologically. Make the movie in your head. What's gonna happen? What's gonna happen next? What's gonna happen? So we see things like, they're gonna come in and they're gonna get an X-ray, and then, they'll go or they're going to come to one place and then they're going to be at another place and it's almost like they get teleported there because you can't figure out how they're getting there who's taking them there i have one where people were going to freaking auburn and and we were like what when did how and and oh we're running a car okay that's interesting lots of liability issues there that we would like to discuss so you know make the movie. Um, um, description of randomization, description of drug delivery and dosage, also in the protocol in a separate place. Um, description of medical data collection from the EMR. A lot of people don't even think about that. They don't even think about that. What do I mean? Um, and then alternative, alternatives and contingency issues. Those are often someplace else in the protocol as well. So if during the course of this project, some, you know, on, uh, that we're doing on high blood pressure, someone's blood pressure reaches this, we'll take them off this drug, we'll put them on this drug, blah, 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 blah. Those contingency issues we need to know about. Yes. So this is not just what you're going to do to the subject or something that actually is gonna to happen to the subject, you know, like a like blood pressure, giving a man. It is that. Is that plus what you're gonna do is because that medical data. Unless yeah, you're, you're doing, doing that, that you're job. doing that to the subject. That's yeah, why people forget about it. You are collecting medical records from them. That's their data. You are okay. doing something to them. So I wanna say, I'm going to ask this question on collect medical records. But you know, I'm just thinking in pre-screening, I guess. Yes, but this isn't just pre-screening. You may do this. You may have a study where they're coming in, uh, you know, once every four months, and you want to get all the data from the medical record that's happening to them. Or if they if something happens to them and they go to the emergency room, you want that data. That's medical record data collection. That is something that's happening to them. You're collecting your hospitalizations data. between visits. Right. And, yeah. You need to tell us about that. Risks actually are, are one of the least going back sections, but I'm just going to go use bulleted lists. Please, again, don't go. Uh, make sure it matches other documents. This is the one that comes back the most. They, the board really, 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 really wants percentages. If you've got them, please put them in. 
I can't stop the board from asking that. So if they ask it, it's a turnaround. So if you have frequencies, so one of the questions asks for uh, frequency and intensity and reversibility. reversibility. We really want all three of those. So put the, so again, read the question and answer that question. Um, and make sure the risk of randomization is fully addressed. Yes, sometimes it's just best to cut and paste that thing from our sample consent, but sometimes it needs to be customized. If you are in this group, you will have a greater, in, a greater probability of having this risk. If you are in this group, you will have a greater probability of this risk. Or if you're in this group, you're going to have an increase in this, meaning this group, relatively, relatively, they'll have a less. You know, so really customize it if it's necessary. Um, all right, those are the HSP questions. Now, you're going to get a handout when you walk out. And the handout, I took the HSP, and I went through and I inserted comments. So it's tiny. Sorry. Put your glasses. Magnifying glasses. But I went through the, all the application, and I went, oh, here's how people misunderstand that one. Here's what we really want here. Here's what, you don't think about this. Think about this. So this is going to be your takeaway. I think it's going to be really handy. Um, and I'm sorry, it's tiny. Um, all right. Most open with submission items. Um, data collection form, CRS. We want those because a lot of times y'all forget to tell us that you're collecting a bunch of HIPAA identifiers. They're not there. <laughs> um, any handouts, cards, uh, emails, letters, reminders, advertisements, intervention materials, site approvals. This is a big one that y'all forget. If you've got a coordinating center, if you've got a sub award, we need the site approvals. Approval for use. If you're getting data from someone else, they need to say that's okay. Um, Pre-visit communications, thank you cards. Even something like a Christmas card for long-term study, we gotta see it. Because sometimes those Christmas cards are postcards. And sometimes those postcards say, Merry Christmas from the STD clinic. <laughs> and that goes in your mailbox. Only it gets delivered to your neighbor accidentally. So that's a HIPAA thing. We have to see everything. Everything they see, we see. Everything they hear, we hear. Everything you collect, we got to see how you're collecting it. Better more than less. I consent pitfalls. I'm going to go quick. Lay language. Basically, the same problem in the explanation of procedures is the same problem in 17a. Put it clear, and I'm going to show you that. All right, these two consent forms are actually written in gobbledygook. It's, it's like, it's fake. You can have a fake Latin generator. It's not even Latin, but it looks Latin. <laughs> um, um, and so these are actually all the same words. Okay? Which one, uh, if you were a, a participant, which one would you want to look at? <laughs> yeah, you would. The exact same words. It matters. It matters. You want some, you're having problems recruiting? Don't give them that. It's just too much, y'all. It's daunting. And that's nothing. That's the explanation and procedure section. Most of y'all studies, that section right there is 15 pages long. I'd rather have 20 pages of this than 10 pages of this. So really, really think about the presentation. Presentation matters on recruitment. And that's why you guys think we're silly when we go, the font changes in the middle here. <laughs> this random word is bolded. Well, what do you think happened? What do you think if you, if you were reading your, uh, your lease and, a, and the word never was bolded, you would think it meant something. What does it mean, I wonder? Uh, I was just too lazy and I didn't want to unbold it. It, it, it matters. 
Fonts matter, margins matter. Give them breathing room in there. How you organize it matters. It matters to retention. I cross my heart to tell you that. Big, long, long uh, description, which is actually well written, but they send us that instead. That is that. Oops, I'm just going forward all over the place. Um, those pictures were perfect. Those are, you can put pictures in a consent form. They're really helpful, especially if they're going to do exercises or do weird things. You know, show them. Benefits don't oversell. If none, so stay. And just remember, 11 points or higher, use those one inch margins. I know we all talk about long consent forms, but long doesn't always mean number of pages. Long can just be visually daunting. Smaller, small, have you ever, have you ever when you were going to school, remember you get some textbooks that were normal and then you'd get a textbook that you thought was skinny and you opened it up and it was like tiny ass print, mm -hmm. and you would just go, oh, crap. That's how they feel. So look at it, read it aloud and see how it sounds. Organize it uh, chronologically. Avoid repetition and redundancy. That's another one. Don't tell them the same thing over and over and over again. That's not making them feel better. That's making them confused. And all those things that you think are nitpicky edits are us trying to protect the participant from being overwhelmed and confused. We're not always just being confused. Sometimes we are. But not always. All right. I'm so like, hey, get what coming up. That's what we're doing. Perfect. All right. <clears throat> so I know people are going to have questions. And, um, I know that Carrie is willing to take them, but if you want to send them to us and we compile them yeah. to Carrie, that would probably a better way. And, um, and I got a bolt to end sleep. Yeah, she got another presentation to do. But thanks everybody so much for coming, and we might do it again. And can